Yeah, it's been good looking at Google it. And when I think of Googling stuff, I think about just the interesting things we sometimes look up, like medical information, um, something so important as your child's you know, health. And you'd think when you have a mother-in-law that's a nurse, a sister-in-law that's a nurse, and a sister that's a nurse, you would just get on the phone and call one of them and ask them for advice. But um, how many people know it's just easier to Google it sometimes? And, um, and it's not always the best way to do it. But what we discussed a few weeks ago is that even Googling things like relationship advice and spiritual advice, people Google all sorts of things. One of the interesting um, scriptures in the Bible, in fact, I think you know how you have some scriptures that get like so much publicity? They're like on all the bumper stickers and there's books written about them. I think there's some scriptures that are, are more low profile than what they deserve to be. And one scripture that I think is really important is Romans 2 verse 15, when it talks about the law of God being written on the heart of all people. And the Apostle Paul's speaking about Jews and Gentiles. And he, what, it, what it essentially means is that all human beings, no matter how evil or good, are made in the image of God. And we have the law of God written on our hearts. So at a basic, fundamental, intrinsic level, we know uh, right from wrong, good from evil. And we are responsible before God, irrespective of ever we've read the Bible. And the prophets in the Old Testament uh, spoke about the, this this truth as well. I think it was Jeremiah, Isaiah, that there would be a time when the law of God is written on our hearts. And so it's really important. So, so I believe that majority of the time in this area of wisdom, that not in every case, but in the majority of cases, human beings know right from wrong. Um, and in your life, the mistakes you've made in the past at one level you've known what you should do um, but the the problem is where we get into what pastor bill preached on last week in romans chapter 7 where you have this sense of the good thing i want to do i don't do and the bad thing that i don't want to do i do and i feel like i'm in this tension this torch within and so even if we know the wise thing to do we don't have the courage or the will to outwork it and when I pray for people, if you're here and I've prayed for you before, you might get disappointed because I've prayed this over you because this is my prayer. When I don't sometimes know what to pray, I pray it because I pray it over myself. I pray for people all the time for wisdom and courage because I think they're like best friends. And when they're divorced, it doesn't work as well, okay? Because some of us in this room are really, really good with the wisdom bit. We're really, really good with applied knowledge so we can apply knowledge and truth in an accurate way but we do not have the courage to outwork what we know to be true and there's some of us in this room that are really good in being courageous and we're good at being people of faith the problem is we have faith sometimes in the wrong thing and we have faith in faith not faith in God and we're not able to discern good we're not able to discern the enemy we're not able to discern um, our own motives we have courage, but we don't have wisdom. So I believe that, and as we said a few weeks ago, wisdom is a promise of God. If we pray for it, God will give it to us. There's a whole pile of things that we pray for and we believe for that God doesn't want to give to us, but He wants to give us wisdom and we should ask for it and He will give it to us. But I believe also if you ask for courage to outwork and to obey His wisdom in your life, the wisdom that comes through the Holy Spirit, He will give you courage to obey as well. And... When I was just reflecting on this message, and we'll read the passage that we're going to be looking at, James chapter 4. And this whole message is looking at James chapter 4, one of the most practical chapters in the Bible. And it's kind of like just lots of little dot points of practical wisdom. I love the way James looks at wisdom because sometimes the Apostle Paul, he lays the theological framework for why um, for who is God, who, who are we in Christ, and how we should live. And generally for Paul, the answer is always Jesus. Like, it's, it's kind of like who you are in Christ. Uh, don't sin because you are dead to sin and you're alive in Christ. And sometimes I just feel like saying, Paul, Paul, that's all really good. Thanks for that. I've got that doctrine down now. So tell me practically how to live. And James, the brother of Jesus, it's almost like, now, I don't understand, scholars debate this, but, but I believe that James is reacting when he wrote his letter. He's reacting to some of the abuses of Paul's teaching. 
And so people were taking Paul's teachings and they were distorting it in a certain direction. So James, the brother of Jesus, comes along and he writes the most practical spirituality that comes out of what it means to be new creations in Christ. But he, he actually shreds it of its religious language. And sometimes we as Christians are really good at super spiritualizing things and actually distorting the true meaning of things. And so James hits us right between the eyes. This is what it means to be a follower of Jesus. This is what it means to be a person of God. This is what, in his words, true religion looks like. And he's saying, you know what? We, as human beings, we're going to be religious. Let's make sure our religion looks like the religion of Jesus, not fake religion, not pompous, hypocritical religion. Let's look like the kind of people that look after orphans and widows and outwork the true spirit of Jesus. And so that's why it's really interesting. James, the whole book of James only mentions Jesus twice. So it's quite a different book. But when I was thinking about wisdom, just before you read the text, I was thinking back to my high school graduation, reminiscing Back in those days, the summer of 99, one day someone will write a great song in the heritage of summer of 69. It will be called the summer of 99. Um, for all you songwriters out there, it's ready to be written. Um, and I was thinking about school graduation and what, you would be, what I would have been jealous of or envious of my peers. Think back to when you were 17. What were you jealous of or envious of, of your friends? Well, you would have maybe, if you're like me, been envious or jealous of the person that was the most popular, the person that had the highest IQ, the person that was the best looking, the person who had the most natural gifting, and the person who had the most exciting travel plans for the next year. And that's all really, really fantastic. But if I was to go back now and say, from my year 12 graduation class of 1999, who would I be envious or jealous of now? I would see it through a very different filter. I call it the filter of wisdom, and this is what I would, how I would judge it differently now. When I look back now, I would discern and look at who has made good choices in their life in these last, how many years ago was that? 18 years. Wow. Who has made good choices? Who has healthy relationships? Who is able to work hard but also have a healthy life balance? Who has invested wisely? Isn't it interesting through the lens of wisdom, the way we judge and assess is so different. And let me tell you right now, it doesn't matter who was the most popular because the person that was the most popular, that is not an, ind that is not an indicator of wisdom and that is not an indicator of happiness. Because I believe that wisdom and happiness are like best friends. I don't be, believe you can be happy in this life if you are not wise. You can have short-term happiness, but you can't have long-term happiness without wisdom. You see, those things, popularity, IQ, looks, natural gifting, exciting plans, they are all things that bring short-term happiness. But I believe that long-term happiness comes from living a wise life. Not a boring life, but a wise life. And um, happiness actually means pleasure and contentment. If ever you think, well, God doesn't care about happiness, He does. He cares about you flourishing and receiving pleasure in this life. He has created you to enjoy His creation. He's also created you to be content with His provision in your life. So when I look back now, I judge things very differently. And the person that had the highest IQ, IQ is not an indicator of wisdom and happiness in life and success in relationships. Who was the best looking? Some people that were the best looking are not the best looking anymore. Let me tell you. And the reverse is also true. The people that have the most natural gifting are not set up for a win for the rest of their life. And how many people know that just because you have exciting travel plans, just because you travel the world, it doesn't mean you distill all the wisdom in the world and you come back to Australia as a whole human being. In fact, some people come back from travel and they don't know who they are. Or they come back from travel and they just want to travel more and they don't know what their life is about. Not that travel's a bad thing in and of itself. So I really believe that the key to happiness and joy is wisdom. 
to pursue a life of wisdom. You win or lose by the way you choose and that the Holy Spirit of God, if you're a Christian, He wants you to make good choices in your life. So we're going to read the um, Bible together and just for something a bit different, I'm going to invite you to stand to your feet for the reading because we're going to read a whole chapter. And we're reading James. You can stand now. It's like, what? We thought we had like an extra 30 minutes on our backsides. This is not normal. Let's read it together. You might want to close your eyes and just let the word wash over you. And then I'm going to start my message breaking down this passage and showing you some amazing keys for what it means to live a happy life of wisdom. Maybe close your eyes or keep it open. It's fine. What causes fights and quarrels among you? Don't they come from your desires that battle within you? You want something, but you don't get it. You kill and covet, but you cannot have what you want. You quarrel and fight. You do not have because you do not ask God. When you ask, you do not receive because you ask with wrong motives, that you may spend what you get on your pleasures. You adulterous people, don't you know that friendship with the world is hatred towards God? Anyone who chooses to be a friend of the world becomes an enemy of God. Or do you think scripture says without reason that the spirit he caused to live in us envies intensely? But he gives us more grace. This is why scripture says, God opposes the proud, but gives grace to the humble. Submit yourselves to God then. Resist the devil and he will flee from you. Come near to God and he will come near to you. Wash your hands, you sinners, and purify your hearts, you double-minded. Grieve, mourn, and wail. Change your laughter to mourning and joy to gloom. Humble yourselves before the Lord and He will lift you up. Brothers, do not slander one another. Anyone who speaks against his brother or judges him speaks against the law and judges it. When you judge the law, you're not keeping it, but sitting in judgment of it. There is only one lawgiver and judge, the one who is able to save and destroy. But you, who are you to judge your neighbour? Now listen, you who say, today or tomorrow we'll go this or that city, spend a year there, carry on business and make money. Why, you do not even know what's going to happen tomorrow. What is your life? You are mist that appears for a little while and then vanishes. Instead, you ought to say, if it's the Lord's will, we'll go and live and do this or that. As it is, you boast and brag. All such boasting is evil. Anyone then who who knows the good that they ought to do and doesn't do it, sins. This is God's word for us. Why don't we take our seats? So, my message title is The Eight Irrefutable Laws of How to Not Be Unhappy. I felt like my message needed a more authoritative uh, title because whenever I read books about something like irrefutable, it means that you can't tell me I'm wrong. So, um, and I read a book once by John Maxwell called The Irrefutable Laws of Leadership, and I kind of liked it. But basically, this, is, this message is about how to be happy and how to be people of wisdom. Point number one is eight, so I'm going to get moving. Number one, we're unhappy because of what's going on inside us, not what happens to us. Wise people know that our faults begin with the heart. Oh, I'm looking over there. I'm like, why is it not coming up? Uh. We're, unhappy about, uh, we're unhappy because of what's going inside us. And the problems in our life begin with the heart. Now, what I'm not saying is that bad things that are done to you are all your own fault. That's not what I'm saying. But what I'm saying, a wise person... If there's conflict or if there's difficulty, starts with saying, how is the condition of my heart in this relationship? Because I'm having conflict in this relationship, if I'm having conflict with my parents, I am not going to just see the blame purely on their level. I'm going to start and saying, God, what is in me that is causing the ugliness in this relationship? Jesus himself in Mark 7.21 says this, For it is from within, out of a person's heart, that evil thoughts come. You see, we often say that the problem with people is that they do the wrong thing. And he lists a whole pile of sins, pretty much any sin that you can think of. Jesus mentions them. And he says the problem is not behaviour, the problem is the desires that come from within. 
For the Christian, we believe that people left on their own will fundamentally not always choose the good and the selfless and the loving. That human beings often left to their own will choose self-interest and self-preservation. And so it's the Holy Spirit that opens up our hearts and says, I'm not just going to change your behaviours, I'm going to change what you love. I'm going to change what you hate. I'm going to change what you desire and I'm going to change you from the inside out. Let me ask you a question. Have you ever met someone that you haven't seen for years and you look into their eyes and it's like they're a different person? I went back to Sydney in my my old church that I grew up in and I met this kid who used to be full on into drugs and he was into some criminal activity and I met him and he came up to me. He looked me in the eye and he just said, hey man, awesome to see you. He was so friendly and so loving and so just his face was so clean and so pure, just the way he was looking at me. And I thought he was being sarcastic. Have you ever not seen someone in so long and you think, wow, are you kind of taking the mickey? Are you being fake? Because God had changed something so much within him that he couldn't contain it with his facial expressions. There was something that was different. Have you ever met someone that used to be really insecure, but they, they, they became secure, they had a fantastic relationship, they became a parent, they had focus and purpose in their life. And, and you saw them and you're like, wow, it's like you're a different person. And it's not because they tried to change their behaviour. It's not because they went to motivational courses about how to talk to people and how to be more assertive. No, something changed within and it changed the way that they related on the outside. You see, I believe that wise people always search their own hearts before pointing the finger at others. Wise people know that the heart can be powerful, it can be deceiving and it can shape our lives for good. Number two, actually just the scripture with that. What co- uh, James 4 verse 1. What causes fights and quarrels among you? Don't they come from your desires that battle within you? Where does hostility, where does difficulty come from? It's not the other person. It actually comes from what's within our hearts. I think it's a really good starting point for all of us as Christians. Number two, we are unhappy because we don't know what's good for us. Wise people know what ha- that happiness is a byproduct and not a goal. Isn't it easy to t- to, that we can see in other people's lives what's good for them? It's really obvious. You can see in other people, I could tell you what kind of girl or what kind of guy they should be looking for. I could tell you what choices they should make with their career. I could tell you what they should be doing in ministry. But it's really hard to make wise choices for ourselves. And we're often unhappy because we don't have the humility to acknowledge that we don't always know what's best for us. Wise people know that happiness is a byproduct, not a goal. Um, James says, you desire but you do, do not have. And he goes on to say, verse 3, When you ask, you do not receive, because you ask with the wrong motives, that you may spend what you get on your pleasures. This is a picture of a person that is craving and seeking after pleasure, craving and seeking after wants, but even when they get what they want, they are not happy. This is a picture of someone that is saying, my desire in life is to be happy. And so I will list down what will make me happy. And therefore, when I get it, I become happy. But the problem is, just like fame, just like celebrity, just like finance, just like having the perfect relationship or the the apparent perfect relationship, seeking those things does not make you happy. Living a wise life makes you happy. You see, uh, I... I wonder how many people in this room once had a dream and their dream was to one day have a really big house with a really big backyard, the Australian dream, with a really nice barbecue and a really nice clothesline. And it was kind of like, man, I just want that dream and and if I could get this massive house and if I can get this massive backyard, then I'll be happy. Then I will come to church every week. Then I will come to church twice a week. Then I will come to church three. No, twice a week is enough. That is about as holy as I'm going to get. And, and it's like, you know, God, if only you gave me that, then my family will be happy. Then I'll go to sleep at night. I'll put my head on my pillow and I won't want for anything more. I won't even want an investment property. I'll just be content. 
rhubarb. You see, the problem with the big house is you have the big mortgage. And the problem with the big backyard is you have big lawns to mow. And the problem with the big house is the maintenance bill's high and the air conditioning is don't even talk to me. And you know, there's plenty of people in our society and even some of us in this church that have big houses with empty rooms with no one in them. And there's nothing wrong with big houses, but let me tell you, if you don't have a purpose for the big house to fill it and to be hospitable and to be generous and to have neighbours over and show the love of God and to be a refuge for people that don't have a home, what good is your big home except a stress in your life? And the very thing that you thought would bring blessing into your life becomes a curse. It becomes something that weighs you down. You see, there's a whole pile of people in this room. Young people these days are amazing. They get married. They don't have any money. They don't have anything to their name, but they still manage to get the best television. (laughs) Do you know what I mean? It's just like, we don't have anything, but we have the most amazing television. And like and, and laptop computers and all that sort of stuff. But let me tell you that you can get all the nice things in life, but then one day God will give you kids like mine that will wreck it all. And so I've made a decision to, I'm not replacing my TV because I have a son that when he's cross, he just punches that thing and he throws that t- things into that TV. And one day I'll replace it. Or you might have really nice carpet, but let me tell you, if you want to be a follower of Jesus, you're going to have people in your house and you're going to have kids in your house, or you might have animals in your house and they're going to wreck those carpets. And you need to ask, what am I pursuing in life? What is going to bring me happiness? What is it going to look like? And let me tell you, if you live a wise life, you will get happiness. But if you just pursue stuff to make you happy, you will never be happy because happiness is not a goal. It's a byproduct of knowing who you are, where you come from, where you're going, and what you put on this planet for. Number three, we're unhappy because we refuse to submit to God. Wise people know it's good to submit when there's love and trust. Sometimes, this is what I call the S word. If I want to ever test someone's reactions, I'll just say, I'll use this word submit because culturally, the word submission is so highly offensive. And generally when people think of submission, they think of that very tricky passage which needs to be interpreted very carefully in the book of Ephesians where it says, Wives, submit to your husbands out of reverence for Christ. But just the verse before that, it actually says, Husbands and wives submit to each other out of reverence for Christ. It's a really interesting passage. And what it says is, in any healthy relationship, and I think this goes for marriage, but it also to a lesser extent goes for other relationships as well. Any healthy relationship, there has to be a willingness for both parties to come under the covering of Christ and also to be willing to submit to each other. Husbands need to submit to wives and wives need to submit to husbands. What does that mean? It means to come under the covering of another. Because there are times when you need to willingly say, I need you to cover me. I'm going to submit. I'm going to lower myself under your covering. And it, if anyone forces you to submit, if any, and I, I've said to women before, if, if a man is abusive and unloving and he forces you to submit, do not submit to him. He is not worthy of submission. You know why Jesus is worthy of submission? Because he gave his life for us. And so he can be trusted with everything. And so when Jesus says, submit to me, he's saying, trust me, I've got your best interests at heart. And so in a marriage, if someone loves you and cares for you, you can at times come under their covering and submit to them, not out of violence or forceful manipulation. Are you with me? If anyone wants to talk to me about that after service, I'm happy to talk to you and show you that I'm right. Um, (laughs) Um. But we're unhappy because we're free to submit to God. So here in the text, verse 4, you adulterous people, Eugene Peterson says, stop cheating on me. Don't you know that friendship with the world means enmity with God? Therefore you choose, um, and then it goes on to say, verse 5, or do you think scripture says without reason that he jealously longs for the spirit that he caused to dwell in us? But he gives us more grace. That is why the scripture says, God opposes the proud, but gives favour to the humble. Submit yourselves then to God. And it's a really important thing to say, how am I going to be a wise person? To be a happy person, I actually have to lower myself and choose to come under God's covering. Okay. 
I've got probably a handful of people in this room that have come to me from time to time about to embark on a relationship, about to embark on a new job, and they've said, Tim, I want to do this. I want to do this job. I want to change careers. I want to change ministry. I want to start a relationship, but I don't trust my own judgment. I want to know what you think because I know that you care about my best interests. Do you know that most Christians refuse to do that? Now, what's not right is if I go up to Ashley Sanford, who had her birthday yesterday, and I say, Ashley, let me tell you about what you should do with all your life choices. Because that's not my place. But if Ashley comes to me and asks me as a, uh, I was going to say a father figure, but big brother figure, because I'm pretty much just a little bit older than you. Um, but if Ashley says to me, as someone that I care about and really, you know, really want what's best for you, Ashley, I will speak the truth in love to you if you ask for my advice. And I'm not in it for anything for, my, for me. I'm just thrilled that you've asked for my advice. And if ever you do want advice with future marriage potential part. Um, you know where I am. I'm only a phone call away. Um, it's all right. I didn't embarrass you as badly as your brother last night, so that was fine. But the truth is this. There's power in submitting to God. There's power in changing course and saying, I want to do this, but I'm willing to change direction if it's what you want, God. This is a good test for your faith. When was the last time I submitted to God when I didn't want to? Yeah, but I, I know you want me to, do, but I don't want to. When was the last time you actually said, I'm going to do what you want, God, even when I want to do the opposite? A job, running away from a problem. Yeah, I know you want me to forgive that person, but I don't want to. I wonder... If you want to be happy, if you want to be wise, you need to recognise that wise people know that it's good to submit when there's love and someone worthy of trust and Jesus worthy of your trust. Number four, we're unhappy because we've ignored the spiritual opposition in our life. Wise people recognise the influence of the enemy. In John 10.10, 10, it defines that the mission of the enemy is to steal, kill and destroy. In Ephesians 6, it talks about that there is a spiritual battle going on for our lives, and it's not just flesh and blood. You know what I think we get really good at? We get really good at seeing the relational issues in life. We get really good at seeing the financial issues or the economic or the political issues. But how often do we say, God, what is going on spiritually in our climate? What is going on in my life? What are the blind spots where, because the biggest tool that the enemy has going for him is deception. He distorts and twists the truth. And in your life, let me tell you, if you've got an issue in a relationship, if you've got an issue in your private life, if you've got an issue in your identity, the problem might be this big, but the enemy is trying to make it seem like it's this big. And, and if, you've got a, if you've got an area of vulnerability or anxiety in your life, the devil wants to anoint that and make it 10 times worse. And if you've got a health issue, he wants to not just, he wants to anoint that health issue to make fear and anxiety go with the health issue. And, and he wants to make you suspicious about other people so that you become obsessed about other people rather than realising that there's a vulnerability in yourself and saying, God, I humble myself, do a work in me first because the devil is, is, is kind of anointing you to be envious and hateful and judgmental towards other people. You see, in this context of practical wisdom, James says that we need to resist the devil. And I believe that you need to come to a point in your life where you, and there are seasons where you actually have to resist the spiritual forces in your life. You have to sometimes push back against demonic influence in your life. It says in Ephesians uh, 4 or 5, be angry, don't sin, don't give the devil a foothold. And the Greek word for foothold can also be translated as opportunity. You see, some of us, we give the enemy an opportunity in our life. He gets a foothold because of anger, because of pain, because of hurt. And when the enemy gets a foothold, he hangs onto that foot until he gets an opportunity to grab our leg. And he might not be able to possess us and take over our life. But let me tell you, if someone's got you by the foot, it affects your ability to run. 
And there are times when we have to acknowledge that there is a spiritual... I mean, we are people of the Spirit. God says, uh, in, in Jesus says, true worshippers will worship in spirit and in truth. I wonder when was the last time that we did like a spiritual audit of our life and ask, I wonder what the enemy has been doing to deceive and to manipulate in my life. My wife and I um, went through a season where we had probably the toughest couple of years in our life when... After our middle son, Josiah, was diagnosed with autism and um, we were having a, a lot of problems with his younger brother, Jude, as well. We had three preschool children and there was a whole season of our life where it just felt like we were reacting to situations and trying to survive. I wonder if you've had a season like that, where it's like, I'm just reacting and trying to survive. And I'm just reacting and trying to hold my family together. I'm just reacting and trying not to fall apart every day. But when you get like that, you can become an expert on the problem. You can read all the books, you can talk to lots of people, but you can neglect the fact that there is actually a spiritual dimension. Not all of it is spiritual, but there's a spiritual dimension at play. And Nikki and I came to a point of just with with a friend and through discernment in prayer, we realised that the enemy is trying to break up our marriage. He's trying to break up our family. And he hates our kids and he hates us. So what does that mean? It opens your eyes to his deception. It opens your eyes to the power of the enemy. And um, and, and we as a family had to push back and resist the devil in faith and in prayer and in spiritual warfare for weeks and weeks until he, um, it says, resist the devil and he will flee from you. We had to resist him until he fled from us. I wonder if... There's a spiritual dynamic in your life that you've been passive to and has been hamstrung, hamstringing you from walking free into your future. Because the truth is, it's really foolish to think that the enemy doesn't have power. But it's all, even more foolish to think that the authority of the risen Christ doesn't have far more power and far more sovereignty. And so we can actually speak out with the name of Jesus, but not just with the name of Jesus, but with the authority of the Lord Jesus. We're unhappy because we've overcomplicated our faith. Wise people know how easy it is to approach God. Look at this. Come near to God and He'll come near to you. Wash your hands, you sinners, and purify your hearts, you double-minded. Grieve and mourn and wail. Change your laughter to mourning and your joy to gloom. Humble yourselves before the Lord, and He will lift you up. You see, some of us as Christians, we become experts in talking about God. We become experts in reading books about God. We become experts at writing comments on Facebook forums. And we become experts at talking to people about church, about Christian culture, about other Christians, about God. And we are experts in talking about God. And we become amateurs in speaking to God. And we are novices when it comes to just being in His presence. From time to time, we need to... Get back to the simplicity of being children of God and the beautiful ease by which we can enter into His presence. Now, it wasn't easy for God the Father to provide a way for us to be friends with Him, to be His children. It cost Him His beautiful Son, Jesus. So salvation was not easy for Him, but it's easy for us to enter in. And what a disgrace that we make it more complicated than what it needs to be. What a disgrace that we erect walls and we erect barriers and we erect erect legalism that says, I can't go to church. I can't pray to God. I can't do this. I can't do that. And God is saying, come to me and I'll come near to you. Because in a theological sense, when we draw near to God, we're not really doing anything. We're just acknowledging our need for Him. That's all. Well, it's not like we're running a mile to Jesus. All we're doing is turning around. And we're saying that God the Father sent Jesus Christ, His Son, to become flesh and dwell amongst us. And His Spirit is with us. He has come a million miles for us. And all we have to do is say, here am I, I need you. And and, and I'm submitting myself to you. How do you come to God? You just say, I need you, God. Don't let anyone make it more complicated than that. Don't make it any more complicated than you can communicate to a six-year-old child when they say, how do I talk to God? How do I talk to my Father God? Wise people know how easy it is to approach God. 
Unhappy people overcomplicate faith. Number six, we're unhappy because we're obsessed with the sins of other people. Oh, yes. Some of you are. Sometimes I am. Wise people know that God is a good judge. Brothers and sisters, do not slander one another. Anyone who speaks against a brother or sister or judges them speaks against the law and judges it. When you judge the law, you're not keeping the keeping it, but sitting in judgment on it. There is only one lawgiver and judge, the one who is able to save and destroy. But you, who are you to judge your neighbour? You see, we spend plenty of time reading glossy magazines or looking on the internet about celebrities and the, the foolish choices they make, and it makes us feel better about our lives. Oh, I would never do that. That's ridiculous. Can't believe they're doing that in their relationships. Or we come to church and then we say, oh, you know what? I felt quite distant from Pastor Bill lately. Oh, I don't know what I'm going to talk to him about. Oh, I know. I've got some gossip. Hey, Phil, did you, did you hear what Pastor Bill said the other day? I mean, that was completely inappropriate what he said. Don't you agree? Yeah, I mean, he's just, that was a really offensive joke that he said. Um, and uh, yeah, yeah. And then, and then you agree with me. And then, and then you give me some information. And what I feel like is we're actually bonding through slander, but it's a false economy. It's fake intimacy and relationship. And so that's what happens when we gossip and when we slander. It makes us feel good, but it doesn't make us wise and it does not make us happy. Wise people know that God is a good judge. Some of you in this room are so frustrated with other people that it's like bound you up. Let me tell you, God sees that person 24-7 and he is more frustrated with you than he's more frustrated than you are. But he's frustrated that that person is in your head. And he's frustrated that you're not talking to him about it. He's frustrated that you're not doing and being the person you're called to be because you're obsessing about the sins of other people that are not your responsibility. We need to trust God in our frustrations. Number seven, it's coming to an end. We're unhappy because we think we're in control. Wise people know that it's not all about us. Now listen, you who say, tomorrow or today, we will go to this or that city, spend a year there, carry on business and make money. That's exactly how we talk. Yeah, I'm thinking about do this job and then make some money and plan this, plan that, do that. Well, you don't even know what will happen tomorrow. What is your life? When things happen that disrupt the flow of our life, we say, well, this isn't what was meant to happen. This isn't God's plan. And we make a whole pile of assumptions about the will of God. You are a mist that appears for a little while and then vanishes. Instead, you ought to say, if it's God's will, we'll we'll live and do this or that. As it is, your boast in your arrogant schemes, all such boasting is evil. You see, biblically, we need to see life as not an entitlement, but as a gift from God. There is no life outside of the life giver. And so the life we have, we do not know how long we have it for. And we are to be good stewards of the life and we are not to be presumptuous. And I believe as Christians, we need to be better at two things. We need to be better at laughing and crying. Because when we're in control, we don't generally do either. There are times when things go crazy, when a situation goes pear-shaped, when you try really hard and things go wrong, where you just need to laugh and you just need to say, man, I am glad that I am not Lord and Saviour of the world because if it was up to me, it would all fall apart. I'm so thankful that I can laugh because God is sovereign and somehow He is going to make it all work out because I don't know how it's going to work out. Do you ever just feel like that? Sometimes you actually feel better when things go worse because it's like, oh my gosh, this couldn't get any more disastrous. It's like the carpet gets to the point, it's like so disastrous, the carpet, that it gets to the point of no return. You're like, you know what? I don't even care anymore. We'll just one day get new carpet. And that's what Jesus is going to do. One day, there's going to be a new heavens and a new earth. There's a plan for your life. You're going to have a resurrected body. And so sometimes we've, as Christians, we've just got to laugh. But there's other times when things go wrong and we're reminded of how fragile and frail we are where we just need to cry and we just need to acknowledge that we're not in control. And God, I, I'm feeling the pain of your creation. I'm feeling the pain of this world of injustice. But wise people know that it's not all about us that there's a bigger plan and that God can be trusted with the whole tapestry, the whole piece of the picture. Number eight, we're unhappy. Can I have um, keys, please? We're unhappy because we focus on avoiding bad stuff. 
And wise people know the importance of pursuing the good. Christianity is really boring if you spend all your life defining yourself by the bad things you don't do. Honestly, one day when you see Jesus, he's not going to ask for a list of all the bad things you didn't do. Oh, wow. You didn't kill anyone. Well, join the list. whoop de doo Why would you? You were kind of like an affluent, upper middle class white dude. Your idea of persecution was your football team not winning. Get on with it. What did you do with your life? I died for you. I had amazing things for you. I placed you in that life to give you a platform so that from your privilege, you could be a blessing to many people. So that you could descend from your platform like Jesus did and you could descend into the darkness of this world and bring the light of Jesus. I gave you that wealth so that you could have disproportionate impact in developing countries. I gave you that house so that you could be generous. I gave you that job so that you could show the love of God to people that thought that they weren't excluded from the kingdom of God. We're unhappy because we focus on avoiding bad stuff, but wise people know the importance of pursuing the good. If anyone then knows the good they ought to do and doesn't do it, it's sin for them. Why don't you stand to your feet?